Let's talk about the light that is to light the whole world at the outpouring of the latter rain. The very message that is going to be the great harvesting message, so to speak. In other words, God's people are going to grow up into maturity because of the proclamation of this awesome message called righteousness by faith. But the key is, is to know what righteousness by faith is. Remember, all throughout our documentary and our supplementary videos, we've been talking about how Satan has done a good job in convoluting the concept of righteousness by faith by mixing both sanctification with justification and creating the infused righteousness doctrine. So what we want to do is really go over the verses. We've done it in the documentary, but we really want to take the time to go over all the verses in the scripture that talk about righteousness by faith and let it be defined totally based upon how scripture defines it. Because there's no way that Ellen White slash the spirit of prophecy gives a different definition of righteousness by faith than does Paul the Apostle. Remember, all the prophets truly are in harmony with each other. They confirm one another. They testify of one another. So they're not different. The concept that a prophet would be different, let's say somebody's been given new light or an insight, there's no way that it would differ or vary from all the confirmed prophets, all the way from the Ten Commandments to Moses. Anything that's in the scripture really needs to all be in harmony with one another. It can't be a contradiction. The concept of contradiction comes from the doctrine what's called, check this out, it's called Neo-Ultramontanism. And that's the idea where basically in the Pentecostal movement or you get it of how like the Pope says that he's infallible. It's the idea that when a spirit comes upon you, the Holy Spirit is what they're calling it, but I believe it's an unholy spirit because the idea is that if what you say contradicts or is different from a confirmed prophet, that that's okay because it's present revelation and that you could contradict even in the next vision of what you said the vision before because it's uh, the Spirit is upon you and you are not your own. You just speak what the Spirit's telling you to speak, even if it's in total contradiction of confirmed prophets or even of the Ten Commandments. Now, of course, I don't believe that, nor does a real Seventh-day Adventist Christian or any Christian really believe that. But that is a, doc, uh, a dogma that has really crept in in this way. A lot of people will read Wagner's writings, even though it would contradict what Ellen White says or what the scripture even says. And then the answer to that is, well, that Wagner was given more light than Paul, Ellen White, or even Moses or whoever and that what Wagner has to say will trump what they had to say, or it'll be a different meaning. He has deconstructed the meaning of it, and they'll give this super prophetic role that's so super that you wouldn't even say that any other prophet would have the ability to contradict another prophet. Of course, that's total heresy, and that's something that cannot be in the ranks of Adventism. The reality is, is that when Ellen White made a lot of statements that sounded a little bit like Wagner, the reality was is put the two together and you'll see in further videos that she corrects what he says. She's not confirming what he says. He says something that goes too far. She's had to make correcting or, or she has to counter influence the words that he says, okay? And then what she does is she will rephrase that in a very, well, with Christian courtesy, with deference, because as you'll see in this study, we're gonna get into righteousness by faith, but you will see that that the demonstration that you have a justifying righteousness that's given to you by Christ is that you will have a correlating sanctifying love for one another and that your desire is to bond and to unify in that love with Christ as the centerpiece of that love like in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 where Christ is in the center of the candlesticks and the churches is around him he's the center of fellowship so what we're going to do is get into a, such an important point of clarification. We have to clarify what is the term biblically righteousness by faith. Is righteousness by faith a mingling of justification and sanctification? Is it a mystical, new, heightened, uh, different level of spirituality that's, you know, the only the initiated into these mystical concepts really knows about? And you need to dig into, you know, the writings of people that are known uh, apostates? 
No. You have to know what uh, thus saith the Lord says. So what we're going to do is go through that extra trouble, um, just because we all need that, to go through and to look at all the scriptures that use the term righteousness by faith. And what you'll see demonstrated is that righteousness by faith is exclusively and only talking about justification by faith. And then we have to further clarify. And then when we're talking about justification by faith, we're not talking about the Catholic version of justification in which it mingles sanctification and with it. We're talking about substitutionary imputed righteousness that is not focused so much about imparted righteousness. It's the substitutionary imputed righteousness that changes your legal position before the law of God. And yes, we will also get into the verses that shows now the result of the imputation of righteousness. When God says, okay, you are now justified, and then he pours the Holy Spirit into our hearts and our lives and gives us a love and a walk and a renewal and a regeneration in our lives and our hearts for one another. Because what we're gonna look at here is that the first tablet of the law is love towards God, faith and trust in him. That is called faith. The second tablet of the law is sanctification, to love one another because we can see one another. We can observe one another. We can actually give practical righteousness and love to one another. So there you go is a, is a real picture of justification and sanctification as an illustration, okay? There's a lot of great insight into this, but what we want to do is to make sure that you are going through the scriptures and when you look at those scriptures that you realize that righteousness by faith is synonymous with substitutionary righteousness in justification by faith. And so why is that term even a little bit different? Why not just say justification by faith? Because justification is talking about the legal reality, what God pronounces you in a court of law. You are legally justified. You are, quote, made, you know, uh, in, in the eyes of the law, you're made right. So when God is saying that you're righteous by faith, he's talking about your you're standing with him, that there is a need of, of continual righteousness. You literally need to be before the law of God and before the infinite law of God, not just here on earth. You need to stand in the temple of God at the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. You need to stand there with a perfect righteousness. And Christ says, I am that righteousness, not focused on what event happens in you. He's focused on the idea that he stands there and what's called a daily, a continual. Remember that Satan is trying to is trying to cast the daily down, trying to uh, replace the daily, trying to exalt himself above the daily. Well, the daily is a con concept of the continual blood flow of Christ, a continual movement of reality that Christ continue perpetually. No beginning, no end. The priest, after the order of Melchizedek, he continually stands there as your righteousness, standing in your place as a representative and substitute. And God can look upon that righteousness at any time in the literal person of Christ and say that that righteousness is forever remaining. He's a priest forever. We have a priest forever, so to speak, in the reality of Christ. And righteousness by faith really focuses on these great insights that you can have encouragement and hope to go on to a life of sanctification because God is not looking at you according to the reality in you. He's looking at you according to the object in whom your faith is in. Super awesome. So you can press on and live a life of glorifying God and letting his Holy Spirit write himself upon your heart and then literally fighting the good fight of faith, loving one another with this undaunted love. And believe me, if you want to say that love is not works, you have no concept of sanctification or the battle that sanctification is because God is going to give you and me many trials for us to practice these loving principles that truly makes up the kingdom of God on very practical play and interplay and interactions with one another. Believe me, God will make sure that you and I are offended in some way in which we're gonna to have to practice forgiveness, love, forbearance, all these qualities of God. As I said, in no way will that merit you, nor is God saying, that's the quality that I need for you to stand at the right hand of God. No, the reality is, is that that is something that you hunger and thirst after. You desire to glorify God because he's declared you righteous and has sent 
the Holy Spirit as a confirmation and as a seal of that righteousness to work out a sanctified life. Isn't that awesome? But remember, what we're going to look at here is the verses of righteousness by faith, and you will see that it is not talking about the sanctified life. It is focused exclusively, not even primarily, but only on justification by faith. So let's check it out. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says this, For I am not ashamed, key, verse, key word, of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is a great justification verse right here. And what Paul is talking about is not being ashamed. That's a key thing because that takes you all the way back into the Garden of Eden in which the reality that we can exist in the presence of God is because we have this robe of light and righteousness and life that covers us. And when they sinned against God, they lost that robe and they stood in shame. And God is restoring that position for us to stand unashamed and naked before God because Christ is clothing us with his imputed righteousness. And we could be unashamed. So therefore, we can have full confidence knowing our high priest is at the right hand of God in the Holy of Holies, standing in our place. God is not looking upon you, but he's looking upon Christ. And you could go in with total boldness and confidence, knowing that he can do a deeper work in your life because God isn't looking to disqualify you by sending the Holy Spirit to search out your heart. He's treating you as a son or a daughter, as an heir, and he is giving you the rod of correction and chastening as a fitness for heaven. So check that out. But let's deal with the issues of shame and righteousness justification here. In Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33, it says this, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. And I'll stop there real quick, because the word obtained is the word Cain in the Old Testament. It was the idea that obtaining can be legitimately, uh, you know, gotten, but Cain did not obtain to it legitimately. He tried to obtain it through his thanks offering, through his perfection, through the righteousness that he was able to produce in some manifest form. But we do ironically obtain a righteousness, but it's through faith. Let's read on. It says, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not, quote, attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith as it were, but by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, and as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Wow, that's very powerful. The shame issue, justification, he's talking about the righteousness was obtained to, not by the inner process, not by the mystical inner process of fruit and fruit bearing, but by the reality that you obtain to it through a trust in another man's righteousness. And that's exactly what Romans 9 is talking about. Another key to really see in there, it's very powerful, is it says that he set that stumbling block where? Outside the church amongst the Gentiles? No. The stumbling block is in Zion. It's amongst the very people of God. For some reason, we keep missing it. We keep trying to obtain to this new heightened level of righteousness that sucked the the, the church members in Colossae or in Laodicea. Now, that's very interesting to understand. The book of Laodicea was written also, excuse me, the book to Colossians was written to Laodicea. Five other times in the book of Colossians, it mentions Laodicea. Read this to Laodicea. If you want the message to the Laodiceans, you will understand it's in the book of Colossians saying that the fullness of the Godhead is bodily, literally, and distinctively and objectively in the person of Jesus Christ. All things are reality in him. It's not that we are all reality or there's a mystical kind of influence impartation that happens and we all rise to this mystical perfection. It totally comes in and deals with the Gnosticism that was trying to come into the church. The book of Colossians is trying to get you outside of yourself and put your faith in another man's Righteousness, that is the solution. That is the medicine that Laodicea needs more than anything else is to stop focusing on their own navel 
gazing and to look up and to look at the man, Christ Jesus, that is at the right hand of God in where your righteousness exists. Abiding by faith on the right hand of God in Christ. That's what faith is all about. And that's the way we will not be ashamed or naked. Let's read on. It says, this is in Romans chapter 10, verses 3 through 11. It says, for they being ignorant of the righteous of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted to the righteousness of God. And believe me, it's not talking about submitted in sanctification. It's talking about that God has declared what he counts as righteous. God is looking upon a righteousness and say, accept his righteousness. That is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's the chosen elect stone in which I am going to build the entire foundation of my government. That's the one right there. Listen to him. Follow him. Put your faith in him. Trust in him. We've moved outside of a religion that is totally Christ-centered into a religion that we look to Christ as a model that becomes centered around our experiences. And we have to be careful because that's not the religion of the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is that we are looking unto another man's life, another man's walk, another man's righteousness, and that is our reality standing at the right hand of God. So important to understand, but I read on. It says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, quote, the man who does those things shall live by them. But, that's end quote, the righteousness of faith speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Wow, very important to understand. This whole idea of transubstantiation in this kind of mystical personal experience in which God infuses himself into us is the concept of bringing Christ from above. That's exactly what the Catholic Mass purports to do, that the priesthood in their magical theurgic crafthood is bringing Christ down from above, putting him in the bread, and in the bread you ingest it and becomes infused into your body. And they're, and they're really bringing up this heresy here in and what you're going to see here is that he says righteousness by faith is not obtained that way. The reality is, is that you hear the word of God. You realize that what God is saying, you believe what God has established. Put your faith in another man's righteousness. He's already obtained to that righteousness for you. Very powerful. I read on. It says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above or who will descend into the abyss. What level of asceticism do you feel that you need to go to? What level of leaving off these things in which you know, you're gonna perfect yourself in such a, such, a, such a way, such a self-annihilating way that you are literally going to find this new mystical experience of nirvana, of self-annihilation you know, or something like that, and that you're going to somehow that's the path to make it to Christ. There's no way. You're not going to be able to, to, to try to find your righteousness in that, taking the same exact path that Christ took and to enter into Calvary and the grave in, in the same way as to copy his path as a means to obtain that righteousness. And that's what that's talking about. So it says, do not say this in your heart, right, to do that. That's to bring Christ up from the dead. <clears throat> but, wh but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And it's not talking about something mystical here. It's talking about, listen, do you receive, same writer here, Paul, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you, did you hear? And what is the gospel? It's telling you to trust in somebody else. Trust in God. Trust in, in who God provided for you as the reality of your righteousness. He's manifest. The Godhead is bodily manifest and then perfect humanity, born under the law, born of a woman, worked out his righteousness, made perfect through the challenges and the sufferings and the trials and the tests of his faith. He has worked out a perfect righteousness and that perfect righteousness has been accepted of the Father and now has been uh, taken and has ascended into heaven. And he is there as your assurance. Lay a hold of, flee to Christ. Does this sound like the gospel? Because it is. 
Let me read on. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen to this. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And then what does it say at the end? And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Our shame will consist on the fact that we try to bring about this mingled mystical righteousness and to stand before God in the last days when Christ comes in the clouds of glory and he is there with all of his host of angels that we were not written in the Lamb's book of life because why? Because we thought that through asceticism, mystical, um, holy experiences, this enveloped um, pseudo-spiritual event that's supposed to take place in us, we try to build our declaration of righteousness upon that. And God says, you should have pursued it by a living faith in somebody else's righteousness, in his righteousness. You should have looked to him. Now you are ashamed. And that's the idea of the whole wedding invitation. Christ gave a parable and talked about the wedding invitation. And he's saying, just come, I provided a garment for you. But the problem is though, we want to weave our own clothes and then somehow put the tag made by Jesus because we somehow commanded the Holy Spirit as some indistinctive eminence of God that has somehow uh, entered mystically into us and God has woven himself inside of us and God can look upon us and somehow declare us as righteous. And that has always been and always will be the great apostasy. And amongst Adventism, what you're seeing is this acceptance of these mystical theory concepts, and they have made their way in, and that is exactly what created the Roman Catholic Church mystical system in its mass, in its transubstantiation, in its monastic uh, lifestyle of the monks, of all of these deep spiritual disciplines, and even the spiritual formation of the ontological mystical unions of these communities and parishes in which they're saying that we're having this mystical experience together. Well, don't think that Seventh-day Adventism is not susceptible to those deceptions. What they should be is hardcore Protestants and believing in substitutionary righteousness, which is your rock and your surety that you can have total confidence that God can look upon you because you are not looking to yourself. You are fleeing from self and you are saying, I trust in your son that's standing before you. And believe me, God will give you corresponding uh, Holy Spirit and love of your brethren, uh, but also a great hard look at yourself and exalted views of Christ and his atonement and his love for you. I read on. This is in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 30, and it just says this. Remember the context. The context will always be, when you're talking about righteousness by faith, justification. And you'll see it here. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely. And that's a very powerful context there because I know that in John, the book of John chapter 15, it says that Christ was condemned without a cause. It's the same exact Greek word here. Justified freely, all you have to do is invert that whole process. When Christ was receiving the sins of the world, it wasn't because of some event that happened inside of his body. He didn't bear a sinful, corrupt uh, nature that had a bend towards sin, and therefore he bore our sins in his flesh in the context that it was literal and mystical. He bore it in the fact that he came in the in human reality, he came as the second Adam and he came even with our weaknesses and infirmities and he suffered and he came in the weakness of humanity. But the reality is, is that he bore our sins in the flesh in the fact that he as a man was condemned for the sins of the world. A mingled nature of both God and man 
and he received the penalties for the sins of the world. And it's the same word freely here, justified freely. Well, without a cause. There was no cause in him that cost him his life. It was because he went as a vicarious substitute, a representative for us. He was as pure as any lamb that was brought to the temple. He was as pure as any high priest could have ceremoniously been made. He was pure. He had to be pure to have alien sins, alien to his guilt, to be placed upon himself. And that's the key to understand righteousness by faith. It is totally about another man's righteousness is now given to you in the books of heaven and your sins are given to him freely or without a cause. It's the same thing. There's no innate reason why Jesus was condemned for sin. It was totally as a substitute and sacrifice. That's righteousness by faith. Don't ever lose the distinction of that because it may be to our peril as a church. I read on justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. How is Christ's righteousness demonstrated? By Christ coming and being the offering for us. Christ coming and living out the perfect life in our place to stand as the human representative. And God has demonstrated his righteousness. Number one, that Christ did that for us. And number two, that God so loves us that this is a gift given to us by him. And this is the core essence of the gospel. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By the law of works? No but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Wow. This is key to understand. All references in the scripture to righteousness by faith is always exclusively talking about what is required for you to be justified. You need perfect righteousness. And the only way you're going to obtain to the righteousness that God demands. Why? Because God is righteous. He is infinitely righteous. He is perfectly righteous. And to, to really exist in his kingdom, you need a righteousness so great that even if you've had sins in your life, it doesn't matter what your present non-sinning state is. If you've ever had sin, you need number one, one to have paid for that sin. And number two, one to stand that even when you fall short in your obedience, that has been brought out in earlier video is that you still need imputed righteousness standing in your place. That's righteousness by faith. Even in your perfect obedience, you still need a righteousness that supersedes your righteousness on the antitypical day of atonement. Let's finish out here. It says, and this is still in Romans, this is in chapter four. It says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who, quote, justifies the godly, the sanctified. No, he justifies, it says, the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. This is so important to understand on the day of atonement, he's talking about the cleansing from sin, the cleansing from unrighteousness. And we have been so focused on the cleansing of righteousness in the germ of sin that exists in our being that God is primarily focusing upon the sins that are in the record books up in the kingdom of heaven. There is no quote defiling heaven, but there is the fact that our sins made it up through substitutionary blood and God can look upon our sins because they are sins that have been atoned for. The only sins that make its way to the heavenly sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, the antitypical Day of Atonement, 
our forgiven sins. That's why we should be confessing ourselves, hiding in the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon this antitypical day of atonement. Because you want your sins to go forth to judgment. You want God to look upon your confessed sins because it comes in the righteous blood. And at some point, that blood is in essence not available to us at some point in regard to our sinning. But God will declare us righteous as we've talked about before because we have been given the inheritance and he has so allowed great persecution, great stress, and the fact that we have matured up into a faith that we are trusting him, that literally that we will not be sinning but confessing ourselves sinners when he comes. And he considers that a broken, ironically, but sealed place. So blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Let me read on. It says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? By circumcision or uncircumcision? And what, of course, Paul gets into here in chapter 4 is that it happened when he was uncircumcised. And we all know that circumcision represents what? The circumcision of the heart. It's talking about a reality that exists within our hearts in the sanctified life. And something which God uncovers our hearts, takes off the fleshy part of our hearts and is able to inscribe his character upon us. And that's what circumcision represents, the circumcision of the heart. So does God impute righteousness after circumcision? Or before circumcision, does he, un, does he justify the godly or the ungodly? And he makes it clear here that you flee to Christ, sin-stained as you are. And I'm not talking even about sinning. We're talking about realizing the depth of our need in our core nature. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, the, the living temple is not such a great place. When heaven is looking upon it, they're saying, we see inbred sin. That's unacceptable. You see, it's important to get more exalted views of the reality of the judgment, and that's what new light is really supposed to do. Because it says that when you're given the Holy Spirit, the sign of circumcision, it's a sign that you are sealed. It's a, the sign of the circumcision is literally the Holy Spirit is de being demonstrated in your life, and you live out a life of sanctification, of obedience, of trust in God in such a way in which he's able to work out his spirit and his love and his character in your life in such a way that that is a seal. You see, our works perfect our justification. That sounds strange, but what, what does perfect mean? It doesn't secure it in that way. It's talking about that it matures it out. How do we love? Well, James makes it clear. We love practically. When somebody's hurting, somebody's fallen, somebody's in a challenge, you go to them in humility of heart. Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 6. When someone's fallen, what do you do? Take an opportunity to be triumphal over their fall and to compare yourself to their sinfulness and say, well, at least I'm not that sinful. And then we think that that's our ticket to heaven? No. If you are truly sanctified, if you are in the sanctified position that God honors and God says, well, I could tell that person has uh, justification by faith because I could tell by the demonstration that I've given them the Holy Spirit and look at their love for their brethren. They would lay down their life for their brethren. That's a manifestation of that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. We'll get into that in just a sec. But remember that righteousness by faith is an imputed righteousness, not focused on imparted righteousness. Awesome that we have imparted righteousness. And in fact, there's no way that you'll be saved without imparted righteousness. But really understand, the focus of righteous by faith is not a new mystical view of it given by Jones and Wagner. When they spoke about justification by faith at that specific camp meeting, they were focused on justification by faith. And it was over time, the movement slid into the mystical ontological theory that we've talked about. So let me read some of the last couple of verses where Paul is saying, hey, beware of the mutilation. Beware of the circumcised people that are so obsessed with it that literally it's a self-annihilating doctrine. And Paul even was kind of cruel about it and says, I wish they'd mutilate themselves like out of my life because these people 
are pushing people to lose the reality that they have in Christ and the hope and the joy that they have in Christ in such a way that they are losing the presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. The book of Galatians is talking about that. I wish they would just mutilate themselves. Get out of here, you know, in that way. And so he's all saying, be careful of the mutilation. Be careful of those people that are telling you you have to obtain to a certain perfection at such a level that, you know, because he says, if concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, he says in Philippians 3, verses 2 through 9, he says, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I counted for loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things, not some things, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of not some things, but all things. And that included his righteousness, his perfection. Let that be your experience and let that be mine. And count them as rubbish, scubalon, the idea of a husk, it has to be cast off. Yes, it may have served some purpose in your life, you know, keeping your life righteous and good and, and without spot in so many ways, but that's like a husk that at some point you have to realize that that is not what God looks upon to say, okay, you've done all the right things, therefore I can justify you. The reality is it says that I have that in Christ and everything else has been but a loss for me and realizing that I've already obtained that righteousness, but I've tried to obtain it through another way. I should have just obtained it by the hearing of the gospel. Believe that God has provided something for me in the person of Christ that I cannot ever manifest in myself at the level that God has required. So it says that, that I may gain Christ and be found, not him in me, but says myself in him. And that's such an important thing to understand. The focus has been so much Christ in me that it's ironic, Paul says, that you lose the Holy Spirit. The focus of the Christian is to be, am I in Christ? I, am I hiding in Christ? Am I saying, God, look not upon me, look upon him? Are you pressing on that way? And that's the key. It says, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in the righteousness which is from God by faith. All right, we're going to really focus on the last verse here, last couple of verses. But I want you to just keep laying hold of it. It stays consistent all throughout Scripture. Righteousness by faith, justification by faith, totally synonymous. There's no difference. There's no new meaning that you add sanctification when it comes to the term righteousness by faith. It is just talking interchangeably about justification by faith. Quote, Galatians 5, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. For you have fallen from grace. For we have, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of what? Righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith working through love, right, that purifies the soul, something that Ellen White said about 600 times. The reality is here, it's talking about justification. But he says that you've fallen from grace through your sinning, through a moral failure somewhere. No, it says you become estranged from Christ. You have fallen from grace because you attempted to be justified through this manifestation of you working out the law in your life, no matter how mystical it is. See, this is a grand failure at the antitypical Day of Atonement to try to obtain to imputed righteousness through a mystical event inside of us. Please never will we ever say that you do not have total correlating sanctification. You absolutely not only will you, you must, but you cannot confuse the two. That's how intense the lines need to be drawn in the Day of Atonement. It is not a blurring of lines the body of Christ needs. It is a distinguishing of lines on the Day of Atonement. Just to distinguish as entering into Mount Sinai when the Lord is there with all of his angels and Moses is up there and there's a line or a core that says, don't go up, not even a beast, or God will shoot through them and they will perish. And it's the same thing on the Day of Atonement. Nobody's to enter into the Holy of Holies. It is a place in which only the high priest, Jesus Christ, enters in because it is too dangerous to enter into the Holy of Holies, such as Aaron's 
two sons. And if you take a look at it, that Leviticus chapter 16 is talking about cleansing the sanctuary because the two sons came and defiled it because they brought strange fire. So, one last little thing. It's interesting because righteousness by faith is brought up by 2 Peter chapter 1, where chapter 1, he talks heavily about the sanctified life, but he first established the basis of a sanctified life. A sanctified life is not established on a sanctified life. Sounds strange. But what does he say? It says that Simon Peter, a bondservant, the apostle, of Christ and the apostle of Christ Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like faith obtained is the key word here which with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ yes Jesus is God and he is at one with his father we only vicariously get to enjoy that before we are face to face and before our bodies are changed. It is then we receive holy flesh. But do we receive a down payment? Do we receive the first fruits? Is God able to work out a righteousness in our lives that we could even overcome sin to show that God has dominion over us? That we are at the footstool of God? That he has a lordship over our lives? Absolutely. God is able to demonstrate that even us in our sinfulness can keep the law of God under the most extreme of circumstances. But the double praise comes from the fact that you're able to say that even with that, we're not proud of our, quote, overcoming. It's the fact that we know that he is holy and we love him, that we would rather crucify ourselves than him, and that we would rather die than sin against the Savior in whom we have love for. Well, that love was imparted into our hearts. That's sanctification. Sanctification would not want to crucify Christ afresh. You love your king. And then if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, where he talks about Noah, you know, and it says an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith, it's talking about Noah believed God and he started building that ark. Noah wasn't saved because he built an ark. Noah was saved because he believed God and trusted that what God said was so. And so he had corresponding works. You see, that's how it's talking about there. It says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, that type of thing. You see how that goes? We work righteousness because we heard the gospel, we believe God, and then we move into corresponding sanctifying works. That's how it works. It's totally that way. One thing I do want to touch on, and I don't want to uh, lose this part because it's so powerful to understand, is that, you know, we need to talk about how we become a friend of God, how we have correlating works in our life, how we have a sanctified life, because if you are truly going to be ready for the antitypical day of atonement and you completely understand the issues at stake of the infinite law and the infinite holiness and righteousness of God. And so Satan can have no accusation against you. You cannot have anything less than the righteousness of Christ standing in place of you. But this is what's so powerful. Ironically, with that in mind, you are now able to receive the Holy Spirit in your life because God does not look at you or treat you or give you the Holy Spirit according to the reality in you. He gives you the Holy Spirit as if you are an heir of God in this way. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Expose the reality of your sinfulness, of your weakness, of the things in our life that are not according to the mind and the person of Christ. So do we have corresponding works? Do we have corresponding sanctification? And is sanctification serious? And James chapter 2 makes it abundantly clear, and I challenge you to go and read that, that there is totally no inconsistency with God. Your justification will always have its witness testifying to the truthfulness of your justification by a sanctified life that is correlating or corresponding or bearing testimony to the fact that you've received this in Christ. Therefore, it is being now worked out in your life because God is totally consistent. He is a life reality. And you gain a great experience 
in the works of righteousness, not in quietism, not in the let go and let God, and he puts his hand inside of the glove that is you, and he's able to manifest himself in all that mystical stuff that's, you know, we talked about with the Egyptians and the word nature and the flag and that God animates you or how the Pentecostals, you know, like the charismatics, you know, that you're just this vessel and God takes it over. That is not how practical righteousness works out. It is a crucifixion of the flesh. It is a work. It is putting your will into the will of God. It is a march. It is a battle. It is a struggle. It is Jacob wrestling. That is the true nature of a sanctified life. And that is the works that are good works, that are righteous works. And that is practically played out in our fellowship with one another. That is so key to understand. Remember, Ellen White uses that phrase in the most succinct economical phrase, I think is so powerful, how she blends the harmony of justification, sanctification. She says, you know, talk about faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Faith, justification, works by love, sanctification, and does what? Purify the soul. Your title to heaven, correlating fitness to heaven. This is what is so important to understand. And what I want you to understand is go back and read Hebrews chapter 10. I won't break it all down here, but understand that it says sanctifying through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Sanctified. Now there is an objective sanctification that we have that reality in Christ, but Christ now imparts. Those that are, that are being sanctified, he is perfected forever. So he, he places an imputed righteousness over us working out with fear and trembling the process of righteous, practical righteousness in our lives. God places the umbrella of Christ's perfect righteousness over our lives in such a way that you can press on, though you have not obtained, Paul says, you press on to your high calling in Christ Jesus. That's the sanctified life. And it's so important to understand that he has consecrated us through the veil that is his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God with full assurance of faith that we have that anchor there for us. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water, and he's stirring us up to good works. That's the whole idea that he's talking about here, exhorting one another, especially as we see the day, the Day of Atonement, the Yoma in Hebrew it's called, approaching. It's so much more important to understand these concepts that he is perfecting forever those who are being sanctified. He has placed imputed righteousness over those that are saying, okay, I'm trusting myself into Christ. And then now he says, okay, now I'm your father and I'm gonna discipline you. All you gotta do is keep reading through Hebrews 10, 11, faith, 12. He chastens you as a son, as a daughter. No one likes the chasing for the time, but it's because he loves you. He's bringing you into a fitness because you're about to be brought into the assembly of the souls perfected. He's talking about you're going to be resurrected. You're going to be with angels. You're going to be with the saints. You're going to be with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You're going to be with Moses and Elijah who are already up there in heaven. And the small group that went up with Christ is the first fruits. Well, the grand resurrection, you're going to have King David with you. You're going to have these people that, and he goes through and talking about it in Hebrews 11. And you're going to have this great cloud of witnesses and you're going to be resurrected with them. You should be acting as if you're going to be in the presence of God and his angels and those that have fought the good fight of faith. You yourself need to be at the, in the war with the church you know, that is militant. So you may enter into church triumphant. All right. Last thing that I really want to touch on you know, in this good fight of faith is talking about do a word search, you know, find the word searches that you like to use and look up faith and love. And you will see that faith is in God and love is for one another. And you'll see it over and over and over again throughout the New Testament. Faith in God, love for the saints. Faith in God, love for all the saints. Faith in God, working out that love for the saints. That is the key to understanding this whole thing. And, and I'm telling you, you know, John makes it abundantly clear. But also Paul, he really touches on Ephesians chapter 4 that if we are going to be a perfect man, if we're not going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, this is what you must understand. That God will have correlating sanctification, correlating works of righteousness, correlating 
you know, um, growth and development in your personal life, in your sanctified life, and the perfecting of your heart, your mind, your attitude, your soul, as you are supplying the needs of one another in the body of Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't want to be tossed to and fro, if James is talking about you want to be perfecting your faith, practical righteousness, practical application in your life of this walk, of this. You cannot hold unforgiveness in your heart and think you're going to make it to heaven. That is a, that is a reality of sanctification. You will undo your faith in Christ if you live not up to the light up to the challenges God is putting you against because he's not brought you into a challenge that will sanctify you that you cannot obtain the victory because he's given you precious promises we must press on in this walk we must endure these trials as a good soldier in Christ and this is the fight of faith and if we engage not in the fight of faith we will lose our faith in that other man's righteousness and we'll tumble into a self-righteousness we'll start to minimize sin we'll start to maximize our own righteousness and we'll find ourselves destroyed naked and ashamed on that day because we don't have the righteousness of Christ that we have trusted and we've trusted in ourselves and yet the whole time we have harbored a faithlessness and an unloving spirit. You see how it unravels there? It's that thread that could unravel us. And what I want to do is lastly touch on 1 John because it will powerfully tell the story here of how important the sanctified life is in helping you to maintain your faith in Christ so that he may continually impute that, that righteousness to you. That he's going to continue to impute substitutionary righteousness in you, but he's making you find out what your real um, liabilities, your weakness, your needs are, your dependency upon him. That's what sanctification does. It gets you very in touch with your weakness. It gets you very in touch with your need. It gets you very in touch with your frailty, that all grass and all flowers are fading and withering. And the reality is, is that you have to go fleeing to Christ that has and is everything to you. So important to understand that sanctification is, a, is an ever progressive realization of your weakness and of your need for him standing at the right hand of God as your substitute. You see, you start to recognize your need. The scales keep coming off. You really start to realize not um, anything less than your true condition. See, the condition for Laodicea is that Laodicea does not see that they are wretched. The man in Romans 7 says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? But he says, I thank God that I serve with the mind, but my body is obviously a disqualified member in this way. So he takes no stock in the event that's happening in his body, but he takes stock in the fact that he has a righteousness that is standing there at the right hand of God. And then he presses on into a life that leads him into peril, sword, famine, nakedness, counted as sheep for the slaughter. But we have Christ who has designated us for glory because we've entered into his sufferings. So important. It says here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 and 14, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his neighbor. For we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. That's how you know. You want assurance? Well, God says, well, here's your brother that you do see practical righteousness is going to actually give you the assurance on that day when Satan accuses you during the Jacob's time of trouble and says that, hey, all of your sins are not forgiven. You know, Christ has moved out of the Holy of Holies. Well, you can take assurance that you have loved the unlovable and that you have forgiven the unforgivable and that you have practiced righteousness. And God says, well, believe it or not, that will help you on that day, not because of your works, but because it's a demonstration of the reality that you were my accepted child because that's what I've done. I've loved very unlovable people. I have given my life for people that while they are yet sinners, I laid down my life. And in fact, I've submitted myself to the hands of angry sinners, the sinful men I have placed myself into to be killed, that you may have the gift of salvation. And this is what's so important here. It says that 
In 1 John 4, it continues on, verses 8 to 20, 8 and 20. He who does not love does not know God. Remember, he comes and says, depart from me, I never knew you. Is it important to know God? Well, this is how you know him. For God is love. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Faith is in something you cannot see. It's not faith to look at your brother and to say, love him. It's faith in God in whom you cannot see. But it is practical righteousness in loving the people around you that have hurt you and wounded you and have done things to offend you in that way. And yes, they may see Christ in your loving acts, your, your long suffering and your selflessness in this way. But this is sanctification. This is what it means to be sanctified in him. This is what the life of working out practical righteousness is amongst the body. Listen to this. It says in John 14, 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And these are the words of Christ. If you don't love him, you're not going to obey this. If you don't love him, you're not going to receive this counsel. Because it says, look at this. This is Paul. He says something so powerful in 1 Corinthians 16. We'll end on this thought. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, if you love me, keep. If you love me, hear me. If you love me, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. And the word here, accursed or anathema, is the word for to set something forth uh, and to hang it upon the wall or on a column somewhere, laid aside for to be devoted to God for the purpose of destruction. It is a total forsaking. If you do not love Jesus, if you do not hear Jesus, if you do not keep these commands that he's telling you that this is for our own good, in no way are we fit citizens for the kingdom of heaven. No way are we going to be walking the streets of gold with the angels. Let him be accursed. Let him be devoted for destruction because you are of no value. There's, and I'm not saying you as a person no value, but that has no value in heaven. These things that we hold on to here that are truly uh, attitudes that we think are so important to us, God says there's, there's so much not a place for that in heaven. Let that be hung up, hung to dry, identified, devoted to God for him to destroy. That's how serious the sanctified life is. So in no way does justification by faith or righteousness by faith minimize a sanctified life. It calls us to a sanctified life without excuse. Thank you for watching.